Good morning. Welcome to Lyme and other tick-borne diseases research for a cure. Our virtual conference October 2nd, jointly provided by Lyme Disease Association and Columbia University Vigalos College of Physicians and Surgeons. My name is Pat Smith and I'm president of the Lyme Disease Association. And I welcome all of you today on behalf of Lyme and uh, of the Lyme Disease Association and Columbia University. This is our 21st Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Conference, our first virtual conference, and the conference is live today. And it will be available recorded only for registrants on the hub through October 8th. And thanks to everyone for helping, the faculty, staff, attendees, LDA board, and all else who helped. And a special thanks to our sponsors, Stephen and Alexandra Cohen Foundation and Igenix Inc. Now, information for you today, there will be no questions on this introduction talk. Questions will be accepted through the attendee hub a Q&A from attendees beginning with a keynote speaker. Questions will not be visible to attendees. The moderator will pose questions to each speaker verbally and then to the Q&A panel during each session. All CME registrants must sign into the hub and fill out their evaluation form by October 10th to receive their CMEs. Information can be found on the hub about the speakers and the conference. I have no disclosure for today. A little bit about the Lyme Disease Association. We're a national nonprofit, basically volunteer run. We've had 30 years of service. We raise monies for research, education, prevention, patient support, and 95% of our monies goes directly to programs. We've awarded 122 research grants and LDA supported research has appeared in 55 journal publications. We uh, worked with our partners at that time, TFL, now GLA, to endow the Columbia Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Research Center, which opened in 2007. And we've awarded 154 educational grants to organizations and a lot of CMA conference scholarships. We have established Lyme Aid for Kids program for children without insurance coverage, and we've given out over $400,000 awarded to date. And we've been accepted by the combined federal campaign for 16 years. That's the federal workplace giving. And we're partners with about 40 plus U.S. Lyme organizations under our LDA net umbrella. And LDA partners with the Environmental Protection Agency PESP program, the Pesticide Environmental Stewardship Program. I personally have testified before the U.S. House Foreign Relations Committee, Global Health and Human Rights Subcommittee, and the Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee on Lyme Disease. I spent four years on the HHS Tick-Borne Disease Working Group and four years on the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program Programmatic Panel in DC. And the LDA website has a free doctor referral, brochure ordering, YouTube channel, and social media. Now, I'd just like to show, because I think it's important for you to see some of the research that we have uh, or currently are supporting. Now, these projects, some of them, their timelines were impacted by COVID. Uh, there's I scapularis as a possible vector of Bartonella hensley. Bartonella, mediated human macrophage activation and antimicrobial activity against the LD spirochete, identifying neural ensembles mediating cognitive abnormalities following BB infection, biochemical alterations of endothelial cells infected with Borrelia burgdorferi, pathogen surveillance and discovery in ticks in South Dakota, Pike County tick-borne disease baseline study, Retinal evaluation as potential screening biomarker for early diagnosis of Lyme. And the South Dakota 
uh, study will be published. It was accepted to the Journal of Vector Ecology. It'll be published in December. Uh, the Pike County Commissioners produced some extensive reports and I think they're working on their papers. And the retinal evaluation, I believe the paper is being finalized. And um, I want to show a quick look at two of these studies, because I think this one is important because there's very little literature on the consequences and effects of Lyme-related disease to vision and retinal changes and vascular symptoms. And these changes often affect our children's education. And I can tell you that schools have little to no understanding of the impact of Lyme on, on child or the child's learning. And school doctors are sometimes brought in to counteract the child's diagnosis of Lyme. Now, I spent 12 years on the Board of Education and 20 years as an advocate for kids with Lyme. I've gone to court several times and children are not often believed, unfortunately, when they have Lyme disease. My own child was out of school four full years and two partial years, and over those four years could barely read a few sentences or paragraphs at a time. So Dr. Padula has kindly consented I could uh, present this little bit so that those who are in attendance might have an idea of what's going on and, and if need be they can look uh, further for this information. So the age range for Dr. Padula's experimental group was 9 to 32 years and the control 12 to 35 years. The conclusion from the final study report, the appearance of peripapillary ischemia in persons below the age of 50 represents a potential biomarker of Lyme-related infection. Primary care physicians, pediatricians, ophthalmologists, and optometrists who have patients presenting sudden onset of visual symptoms, in addition to the appearance of peripapular ischemia, should be tested to rule out a Lyme-related infection. Now, this was his chart, signs and symptoms reported by subjects with tick-borne diseases, fluctuation in vision, difficulty with reading and near work, light sensitivity, reduced convergence, headaches, brain fog, pulling sensation behind eyes, poor comprehension, reduced memory, fatigue, floaters, and unable to tolerate moving environments. And he also has an article in Modern Optometry of 2021. Uh, on the issue. And at this time, I'd also like to mention that I worked with Congressman Chris Smith, who's the co-chair of the Lyme Disease Caucus in the House, and we produced a piece of legislation that was introduced, Children Inflicted by Lyme Disabilities Act, uh, and that was introduced in May of this year, and it would uh, would focus under the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act to hopefully help our children in schools who are suffering from this disease. Now, the, the Lyme grant to the Pike County, Pennsylvania study, this area is important because it impacts reporting, case numbers, diagnosis, and treatments in some states, uh, surveillance. And Pennsylvania has the highest reported US case numbers for many years. 2019, they had almost 9,000 cases. Pennsylvania is classified as a high incidence state by CDC. And Pike County has a higher than the state average Lyme infection rate of their ticks and has a very active educational task force. LDA funded and disease uh, surveillance study. Uh, the ticks were collected for 2018 and 19. There were a thousand black-legged nymphs and adults tested. And the molecular presence of all seven microorganisms were detected. 46% of ticks tested were positive for at least one of five TBDs. And Bartonella and Mycoplasma were excluded in that 46% figure because the CDC does not recognize them as tick-borne diseases. Organisms tested for and percents found in ticks, Borrelia burgdorferi 39%, Bartonella 19%, Anaplasma phagocytophyllum 13%, Babesia microti 5%, Mycoplasma 3%, Powassan virus lineage 2, 2%, that's the deer tick virus lineage, Borrelia myomotui 2%. 
So the important point is that surveillance like this needs to be done in low incidence states and rarely is. And so the soon to be published LDA funded tick surveillance in South Dakota, we hope will help in that regard. So what is the high incidence versus the low incidence states? This is the CDC map. And you can see the darker areas are the high incidence states and the, the other uh, areas are the low incident states. So CDC reported Lyme cases for 2019 were approximately 35,000. Uh, 35, and they show Lyme to be the most prevalent in 16 CDC designated high incident states. Now that designation is defined by the CSTE, the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. So there's a, a lack of government funding for tick surveillance overall. Thus, little or no tick surveillance in many low incidence states take place. So some questions that arise from that are Lyme ticks, are Lyme transmitting ticks found in low incidence states? Do those ticks contain Lyme spirochetes? And if so, what is the infection rate of the ticks? Are those states surveilling and releasing the data? So CDC's tick surveillance data sets page on that says, counties classified as no records should not be interpreted as the tick being absent. No records could be a result of a lack of sampling efforts, tick collections, or a lack of reporting or publishing the results of sampling efforts. So a lack of understanding of this issue leads to reluctance to diagnose and treat in certain areas. And that reluctance can lead to delayed diagnosis and treatment, which may result in approximately 20% of patients experiencing continued symptoms after initial treatment. No Lyme here, oftentimes patients are told. So Lyme patients often have to travel great distances for care. My Lyme Data Registry, the 2019 chart book, states 31% of patients traveled 100 plus miles. We also have that cited in the HHS Tick-Borne Disease Report to Congress uh, 2020, some of My Lyme Data Registry stats. And this leads to increased medical costs, family, work, and school disruption. So what is the increase in Lyme disease? Estimates per CDC, Numbers of US individuals diagnosed and treated for Lyme from 2010 to 18, based on insurance claims, approximately 476,000 individuals annually. That's a 59% increase over 2005 to 10 number of 300,000. So this increase may be partly attributable to spread of ticks into new areas, especially low incident states, where again, there's little focus on tick surveillance and thus on Lyme education and awareness. And in high incident states, increase may be partly attributable to higher tick numbers and developmental patterns bringing people into closer contact with tick vectors. So increased tick surveillance, which documents tick numbers and tick infection rates, contributes to higher Lyme awareness, increasing diagnosis and treatment. So what are the CDC reported cases versus the health claims for Lyme? Well, a Harvard Medical School study with positive Lyme test rates between 2010 to 16 from Quest shows a dramatic geographic expansion in the positive rate for Lyme across the nation. High positivity rates in many states previously considered low incidence. This expansion was supported by Fair Health's database of over 23 billion privately billed healthcare insurance claims, which showed significant discrepancies in three low incident states between reported case numbers and healthcare claims numbers for a Lyme disease diagnosis. So, although characterized low incidence, all three states rank in the top five for Lyme related insurance claims. North Carolina, 32 reported cases, 88,539 health claims. California, 90 cases, 46,820 health claims. Texas, 31 cases, 31,129 health care cases. 
The claim lines do not reflect the specific number of individuals with Lyme, but rather the numbers of encounters that individuals with a diagnosis of Lyme have with the healthcare system. So information on this issue is also reported in the Training Access to Care and Reimbursement Subcommittee Report to the 2020 HHS Tick-Borne Working Group and in the HHS Tick-Borne Working Group Report to Congress 2020, both of which I was a co-author. So at this time, I am very uh, happy to introduce our conference co-director and co-moderator, He's the professor of, professor of Clinical Psychiatry, Columbia University, Vigalos College of Physicians and Surgeons. He's the director of the Lyme and Tick-Borne Diseases Clinical and Research Centers at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. And in his spare time, he was the co-author of Conquering Lyme Disease, Science Bridges the Great Divide. Now down in the corner, you may wonder what that is. And that is actually a PET scan with an overlay that we used in our 2004 conference. And that was courtesy of Dr. Brian Fallon, who if you don't know, Dr. Fallon loves to study brains. And that's probably one of his favorite pastimes. I've known Dr. Fallon now for 90, uh, since 1995 and uh, the LDA wants to thank Dr. Fallon for his work over the years. And I would like people to see that doc, this man spends a huge portion of his life dedicated to this disease. He isn't just in the laboratory or in the research center or at Columbia University. He's everywhere across this country and either other countries in the world. So the first picture on the top is the late 90s at our great imitator fundraiser, Dr. Fallon in costume. And the next picture I, has a, a then Attorney General of Connecticut, Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Richard Blumenthal. And down below is Dr. Jones, and that was in 2004. And there's uh, Dr. Fallon and I at the Burn Burton Academy in Vermont, 2005. So we were speaking there. Uh, and then the picture underneath that is our Gear Up for Lyme, Vermont. They uh, did a bike climb up Lyme benefit for us for many years, the Manchester Rotary. But we obviously are not on bikes. We're sitting on the hill in a good spot watching them ride up this mountain for us. And there's Dr. Fallon at the 2008 conference. And important, the Columbia Research Center opening in 2007. And there's actress Mary McDonald, who was the LDA spokesperson for Lyme for quite a number of years. The second row is 2001, Dr. Fallon presenting to the military officials in DC at a meeting arranged by Congressman Smith for the LDA so we could bring in experts. And I, uh, that's Dr. Beriscano there sitting down behind Dr. Fallon. In the middle, that's the LDA's Literati with Lyme in 2005, a number of authors who had Lyme spoke about their issues and author Amy Chan, you might recognize there. And there's Dr. Fallon at the 2016 conference and our 20th LDA conference, there's the LDA board and also Dr. Betty Maloney, who's on our faculty today. And the bottom row, he never forgets about the advocates. That's our 2011 conference and he's on stage with all of the advocates. And then we have a 2017 conference. There's Congressman Chris Smith and Dr. Fallon and I on the stage. And in 2018, we have Dr. Fallon and there is our keynote speaker on the left sitting in the panel, uh, Dr. Alcott. And so again, uh, with great pleasure, I introduce and I thank Dr. Fallon for his work.